I'll take as long as anyone will give me to write something. You have to take it away from me. And that's not good, because, I mean, you go back to the 19th century and there are plenty of writers who seem to be able to just turn it out and uh, without worrying about um, gnawing it to death like a bone. I'm George Plimpton, and our guest today on Writer's Workshop is a journalist who's famous for the cream white soups that must make his table manners most fastidious. I think you're going to be surprised to hear him admit two things. First, that his famous writing style, so lively and personalized, does not always come flowing out of his brain like water over the Zambezi Falls. Like most writers, there are times when he really has to struggle for the right words. And second, that he suffers from an affliction that strikes famous writers, believe it or not, as well as unknowns, writer's block. His name is Tom Wolfe, and writer's block is just one of the problems you'll hear him discuss with William Price Fox and the students on Writer's Workshop. One thing I wanted to know is the new journalism, or the more personalized type of journalism that you write, isn't it really kind of a return to the type of journalism that was written before the wire services? came into effect? I mean, wasn't there more personalized journalism then, and then the wire services changed it, and then now it's moving back into a more personalized style? Well, that's true if you go back to some of the newspapers that were published before the Civil War. You'll really find some wild prose, not always good, but often wild. And the kind of Tennessee school of journalism that Mark Twain writes about. Uh, where the, in the lead paragraph is about the scoundrels and bushwhackers who are, <laughs> uh, who are now part of this disreputable town that we live in, this kind of, this kind of, it was, it was really very colorful. And the telegraph itself, as, a, as an instrument, really introduced bureaucracy to journalism. Uh, it costs so much to send things by the wireless. It then began this this uh, idea of concise journalism. Concise journalism is often absolutely impenetrable. Uh, you, the, these marvelous condensed twelve word leads. It takes about the next ten paragraphs to explain what this uh, uh, what this lead said. Often repetitive writing uh, is the, is the clearest and the easiest to read and saves time in the long run. I mean, Hemingway is a good example of that. Hemingway is has a kind of biblical habit of of saying things such as uh, we walked through the the woods and there was snow on the branches and the wind came through the branches and the snow fell from the branches down onto the onto the woods and it was cold there because the wind was coming through well it's a little i'm doing a bad parody of hemingway but it's there is something very effective about not being concise if it's if if it's done with a with a purpose and if magazine journalism in the in the 60s made any uh, impact at all, I think it was partly because there were writers who s began to say, well, let's just forget some of the conventions of, of, of style and, and, and journalism and, and s try to do something uh, different, or at least try to use some of the freedom that you, that you find in fiction. I wanted to ask Mr. Wolf, in your, in your long, marvelous descriptions, where you use a long string of adjectives to describe something, is this something you really, really work um, a long, long time on, or does it just come naturally to you? It's something I work on, to tell the truth. I think the greatest, the most important trick in, um, in writing is to make it appear spontaneous. Mm -hmm. Writing is an extremely artificial medium when you think about it. You're taking sounds and you're turning them into 
little symbols on a page. That's artificial to begin with. And then to make them s read as if they have been spoken or, th or thought spontaneously, I think is a, one of the supreme tricks <laughs> in, uh, in art. And I was, it's such a struggle for me to come up with that sort of thing effectively. That was much relieved to see that other people have been through the same thing. Celine, for example, if you've ever read Death on the Installment Plan or A Journey to the End of the Night, it seems like you're, you're listening to a man who's just come in off the street and he's telling you the story off the top of his head. He really introduced slang to, to serious French literature. He's kind of the Mark Twain, in a way, of, of French literature. And it turns out that he spent four and five years polishing the spontaneous... <laughs> These, these spontaneous uh, utterances, and so it's it's uh, it's tough. I think if if things are going well for you in writing, uh, and I'll say a particular morning, a particular afternoon, sometimes marvelous rushes of 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 words will just fall will just fall into place, and other times you you just kind of have to put your head in a vice and and <laughs> make them come out. After you've worked hard at, at uh, getting them spontaneous, do you know when you've reached the point? I mean, is there a time when you know that it finally fits together and it's after your hard work, it's the spontaneity that you were looking for? If, if Sometimes, but uh, very, very seldom do I feel that very seldom can you trust your judgment the moment you've written something. Uh, it's, I'm sure everyone who's written has this feeling of going to bed very proud of something they've written and then getting up the next morning and realizing it was absolute, uh, the, the most stilted, stiff, cumbersome thing was ever, um, was ever put down on paper. I think that after a, um, after a couple of days you can only fool yourself so much you begin to see the, uh, you begin to see where it goes, where it goes off. And of course sometimes you can over polish. If I'll take, if I'll take as long as anyone will give me to write something. You have to take it away from me, and that's not good because I mean you go back to the 19th century, and there are plenty of writers who seem to be able to just turn it out and uh, without worrying about um, gnawing it to death like a bone. Uh, and you can sometimes you can over polish. Sometimes I think there's a there's a virtue in us in, in leaving some original roughness in a piece of in a piece of prose, and you can see this in in people who wrote it great speed, and you can see it in Zola, you can see it in, in, in Balzac, and it's not, it's not all bad, the rough, uh, the rough edges. The first piece I, magazine piece, the first long piece of any sort I ever wrote, the uh, Candy Colored Tangerine Flake Streamlined Baby, was one I did extremely fast. And I look back on it, a lot of it seems very awkward to me, but I have a feeling that if I had ever tried to polish that piece, it might have been like sandblasting. You know, you sandblast an, an old stone house, <laughs> you end up with just a little round mound that's left. It's, everything is, is, uh, all the features have disappeared in the polishing. And I think that can happen sometimes, too. Sometimes it's best just to have somebody grab it away from you and, uh, and be done with it. Wasn't it true that you hadn't really planned for that piece the way you'd written it to be published? That's true. Um, that piece was, as I say, my first magazine piece. There was I was working for the New York Herald Tribune. It was a strike, which lasted four months, and so I went to. I had to start doing some freelancing. To that strike was the best thing that ever happened to me because it forced me to start writing at, 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 at greater length. So I went to the Herald Tribune or to Esquire, and I sold them on the idea of a piece about customized cars in California, and they sent me out there put me up in the Beverly Wiltshire Hotel and where when you arrive there's a basket of fruit and a split of champagne on your uh, on the table and that was a grand life and I, I ran up about a six thousand dollar <laughs> bill uh, in, in the course of a month in this, in this hotel and I came back and I couldn't write this story I was absolutely blocked and I realized that all writers blocks are nothing but fear it's either fear that you can't do it or fear that if you do it, it isn't worth doing in the first place. I mean, that's also a real fear often. <laughs> anyway, I couldn't do the thing. And so the Byron Dobell, who was then the managing editor of Esquire, called me up and said, we've got to have the piece. We have $10,000 worth of, of uh, plates, color plates of these goddamn machines that you're supposed to be writing about, these customized cars, on the, 
um, on the presses. And I said, well, I just can't do it. I'm blocked. And he says, well, look, just type up your notes, and we'll give them to a competent writer to put into some sort of shape. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I wouldn't have done the humiliating thing of typing up the notes, except that I had run up to $6,000 at the Beverly <laughs> Wilshire Hotel, and I felt so guilty. I said, I can't. Are they, maybe they'll make me pay back to 6000 So I, uh, with a heavy heart, 8 o'clock one night, I sat down and began typing the notes. And I remember it began, I, it was in the form of a memo to Byron Nobel. I said, Dear Byron, uh, the first place I saw customized cars was at 18 Fair in North Hollywood, California. It was done in a very flat, straight out way. And I began describing step by step what I had seen in my reporting. And I was typing at absolutely top speed in order to get it over with. And it was to just one person, so I had no self-consciousness about other people looking over my shoulder. And I ended up writing 48 pages that night um, on the typewriter. And I turned in, brought it over to Esquire about 9 in the morning, and then went home to bed and got a call that afternoon from Byron to Bell saying, we're, we're knocking the dear Byron off the top of your memo, and we're running the piece in the in the magazine. Well, that was really my start in magazine writing. And many people go through this without knowing it when they write letters to friends. And I think all of us have known people who are great letter writers and can just leave you in stitches. And they're great stylists and they have a flow and a rhythm and everything else. The same person is assigned a paper in a classroom or an art, uh, just assigned to write an article for a newspaper, and they freeze, this person will freeze up. Because I think when it's going to be for an, a larger audience, you start thinking of all the, the, the teachers who may be looking over your shoulder, classmates, other writers, whoever it may be whose opinion uh, intimidates you, and people stiffen up. When I read things by students sometimes, I cannot, for the life of me, comprehend where they have picked up some of the habits, some of the, the stilted, over-formal, uh, passive constructions that we'll get into. Because they don't, I'm sure they don't write that way in letters, and I'm sure they don't talk that way. And they're not taught this either. You're not taught, I don't think anyone any longer teaches people over-formal uh, uh, prose. Nevertheless, it comes in almost like politeness into the, in, in, into the into written language. Last night you talked a little bit about the literacy crisis. Um, I was wondering if you, uh, as a child, had any kind of premonition that you were going to be a writer? And if so, did you have a teacher or something who was able to grab hold of that and develop it or inspire you? I went to a, a school in Richmond, Virginia, where you really didn't need just one teacher to find you. The emphasis, was so, the emphasis on writing was so intense that looking back on it by, what's, by what you see going on in high schools today, it was really quite, quite remarkable. In the sophomore year of high school, we had a course in, a for, in formal rhetoric. Now, I, I assume that these courses exist in colleges today. I'm not sure. But uh, this, was in, this was in high school, and you were taught in a very detailed way, paragraph, paragraph construction, uh, you were taught uh, at least 20 figures of speech and, and made, to use, made to use them uh, um, in various combinations and this sort of thing. And every course except mathematics involved writing. And today I find in many high schools only the English course uh, will involve writing, if, 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 that, if, if in fact that involves writing, and, and in history and courses of that sort, you're, there's multiple choice uh, uh, examinations and, and, uh, and so on. Have you ever wanted to write fiction? I have. When I was in college, that was, if you were going to be a writer, that was what you were going to, that was what you were going to do. The, the novel, and I think it perhaps is still true, was the one of the last great American dreams of completely turning your life around overnight was like striking oil or going out and finding gold. And I th I'm sure there, to this day there are plenty of people who look upon the, uh, the writing of a novel as the way they're going to turn their lives around. But also it was what you were, it was the goal you went for. So 
certainly when I was in college, was to, and everyone assumed they were, if they were interested in writing, that they were going to write a, uh, a novel. And to this day, I, uh, I feel like I should try uh, to write a novel, if only to answer the, the in inevitable criticism of nonfiction writers that, that they're ducking. <laughs> They're ducking the big one. They're going off on all these elaborate uh, uh, tangents to avoid it. Every time I finish a long book of, of nonfiction, I've just finished a book on the astronauts, I swear to myself I'm never going to write another book of nonfiction because it's, it, it, there are so many obstacles bit, built into the, the, the fact that you are trying to be uh, faithful to what actually happened without embroidering. God knows you get accused of embroidering enough even then. Um, I've had in my mind I would like to do a novel someday. I guess there's no use talking about it someday much longer when you're almost 50. Uh, a, 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 a kind of vanity fair um, for our times. You, I, I, for some reason, all the, the novelists in New York and for that matter, in Los Angeles, kind of avoid the, the task that Thackeray took on, or that uh, uh, Balzac took on, or that Gogol uh, took on, of doing the, the, the kind of panoramic novel of life and styles of life in the, in the, in the, in the city. And that, as a, as a kind of a piece of fiction to tackle, does, uh, does interest me. I have written one short story, and that was about three years ago, appeared in Esquire. It was called A Commercial. It was about a, an athlete making a perfume uh, mm -hmm. commercial. You talked about uh, getting accused of embroidering, and I've uh, read explanations you've given about how you uh, research and report and interview. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us, do you ever take liberties in your writing to maybe spice the story up? And also, could you talk about your interviewing techniques? Well, by, by spicing a story up, I have, I've, I've, never, I've never done any of the following things of which I have been, <laughs> which I have been accused. I have never invented a scene. I have never invented um, dialogue. Uh, I have never um, merged different scenes um, in order to to uh, make come up with one scene that's a piece of uh, that's a piece of dynamite. Now there is there is a a lot that is done in that you that you can do in terms of interviewing people about their thoughts, for example, which is a controversial sort of thing to do um, in order to have to use a device of, in, of interior monologue or of, of simply of point of view. I'll give you an example from the work of someone else. John Sack is a writer who did a, a book called M. He went to Vietnam with a company which trained at Fort Dix. He started with, with them at Fort Dix, went into Vietnam. And after each piece of action, such as a, a a skirmish of some sort. He would then interview various soldiers about what they were thinking at the time of the action. Then he, when he wrote it, instead of saying, after the battle I asked Sergeant so-and-so what he was thinking and he said this, he puts the thoughts into the, uh, into the action itself. Now I've done that also. I did an electric Kool-Aid acid test uh, of uh, I have a long scene in there of Ken Kesey's paranoia while he's hiding out in the jungles of Mexico and thoughts running through his head, which I obtained from these thoughts I got from interviewing Kesey, from reading his letters to Larry McMurtry that he wrote at the time, and from tapes that he made uh, while somewhat twisted in a paranoid fashion uh, from marijuana, sitting in the jungle, smoking and writing. And putting these things together, I felt I knew what he was thinking at that time. No, uh, obviously, this is not, cannot be called absolute truth. There's no way known to record someone's thoughts on the spot. Nevertheless, I think it's an important thing to do in nonfiction as well as fiction to get inside of people's uh, 
central nervous systems in that in that way. If someone does an autobiography, it's it's immediately accepted. If somebody is writing their autobiography and they say and they tell you what they were thinking at a particular moment or what they said at a particular moment, everyone accepts it as as gospel truth. So I figure what I'm doing in that case is is, is writing part of that person's autobiography for him. Uh, I'm putting down the thoughts that the person had at that time as well as he can remember it. Obviously, people cannot remember all of their thoughts, and also they tend to leave out the humiliating parts, as Orwell. Orwell said he never read autobiographies because people never put down the, the real story of a man, which is all humiliation. Uh, so so that, that can be, I suppose, could be called... Uh, Well, reshaping the truth a, a little bit. I don't know any other way to to uh, to get at it. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I wanted to ask you what you went through to get your first book published. Did you have an agent, and how many publishers did you have to go through? I'm trying to remember now. I did have an agent. And I rem that my first book was a collection of magazine pieces, and very few people were interested at all in publishing it. Um, collections of nonfiction usually did very poorly. For that matter, collections of short stories were hard to publish uh, at that time. And finally, m m many publishers would say, we'll publish your book of... Um, of short pieces if you'll also sign a contract to do another book on this, this, uh, or this. And maybe we'll publish that second book first and then we'll publish your, <laughs> yeah. your, your collection. And this, I realized, was just meant that the collection wouldn't be published at all. I finally, Farris, Strauss, and Giroux seemed genuinely, Henry Robbins was the editor there at that time, I seemed uh, genuinely interested in the, uh, in the collection without insisting that there'd be this other <laughs> uh, long piece with it. And then the agent, in this case, my agent's name, Lynn Nesbitt, was very useful to me. I mean, she was the person who, I would have been, I think, crushed by the first two or three <laughs> rejections. <laughs> and she just, just kept pushing on until she found somebody who was interested in, uh, in doing it. And I think for book, in, for publishing a book, an agent is, a, is very useful for for publishing articles, I don't think you need an agent to get an article published. You probably do to get a short story published uh, these days. Just if I mean, if you're if you're not known, um, just because you you really need a uh, there's so few short stories published. You really need someone, a friend in court, uh, you either an agent or a teacher or someone who is known by the publishing house or the magazine uh, who will vouch for you and say this person does have talent or, or whatever it uh, may be. But in, in nonfiction that isn't so. You can just kind of, uh, it's really fairly easy to get a piece of nonfiction published if the idea is good. If you are interested in a particular magazine, look at the masthead, let's say Esquire, go down, go down the list to the assistant editors, never mind the, the top man, go down to one of the lower the junior people, not a contributing editor, because a contributing editor is just a writer. Um, it's just an honorific title. So someone has a title like assistant editor. And write them or call them and propose the idea, even if you've already written the piece. Propose the idea. See if they're interested. Don't tell them you've already written it. <laughs> uh, because they like to feel they're having a hand in the creative process and that they're kind of just, and they're guiding you. And if they're interested in the idea, They'll tell you right away, and then you wait a decent interval and send in the pieces if you're following their instructions. That you're <laughs> or actually, it can save you a lot of grief because you may know whether they are interested or what or the sort of things that they, they might like. The reason you go to a junior me member of the staff is that the junior members of a staff of a magazine are in competition with one another to discover new talent. That's one of the main functions of a junior editor is to discover new talent. The top editor is above that. He's He's is taking more of the of the, of the large view of, of things, and he has a lot of things on his mind. But that the the younger editor will really be looking for 
uh, for new talent. And it's really not nearly as hard as you think. You, the idea that you come up with, though, has to be something that you have, if you're not known, has to be something that you have unique access to. In other words, it's no use proposing a, a profile of Cyrus Vance. Well, actually, it's no use proposing that anyway, no matter who you are. But, um, because they could get a lot of people to do that. And it's a kind of an obvious uh, idea. But if, let's say, there was something uh, happening in um, at Fort Jackson. God knows there must be lots of things happening at Fort Jackson. I don't know what they are. Um, and you knew about it, and you knew the people involved, whatever it might be. Now, this is this sort of thing. If it had, um, if it was, if it really had interest, would be the sort of thing. They would say, "Go ahead, you do, you do that story. You are there. You know about it, um, and, and take a take a shot at it." And I think a lot of people are feel they just can't get through the door so they don't propose the good ideas that they have and it is much I think it's easier to do than, than you think you've uh, spent much of your career looking at the personal lives of other people I'm, I believe I read somewhere that you even work seven days a week and uh, I was wondering if you've had a chance to have any personal life or if that's your life has been your work when I look at my personal life, sometimes I feel very, very sad. I occasionally get these questionnaires in which you're supposed to, to list your um, avocations and hobbies. And all my life I've wanted to be able to put down hunting, paragliding, uh, water skiing, spear fishing, and or at least something that shows I get away from it all and go out and do so, have a little, little daring do. I finally, with one, one of them, became honest and I put down as my hobby window shopping and that's really about the only thing that I tend to do that could be that, that, that is apart from either working or making believe that I'm working or finding ways to avoid uh, seemingly useful ways to avoid uh, uh, working and when I put this thing down about window shopping they wouldn't run it they thought I was making my little making my little joke that's I think that's the real reason I stay in New York is that it's to me, it's the eternal state fair. The fair is always on. The high, life, the high point of the year in Richmond, Virginia, where I grew up, was when the state fair came in September. And uh, you could get out, take 60 cents to the state fair, 12 nickels, last you all day long, get those snowballs with the raspberry flavors, take a ride on the Ferris wheel. And uh, I window shop. This is George Plimpton thanking you for participating in our Writers' Workshop. Please join us again next time.